American Catholic History is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hello, and welcome to American Catholic History. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Today we're talking about how the first bishop of Sacramento came out of the California Gold Rush. He acquired his riches and connections in the California Gold Rush, but his beginnings were very far away from California and gold, weren't they? Yes, very. And like a number of our stories, this one starts in poverty in Ireland. In 1832, Patrick Minogue was born, the fifth of seven children in County Kilkenny. When he was just three years old, shortly after his youngest sibling was born, both of his parents died within a few weeks of each other. So his two eldest siblings, a 15-year-old brother and a 14-year-old sister, were left to care for their five younger siblings. Wow, so two teens taking care of five younger children, including a newborn. That sounds crazy. How did they end up in America? Well, the eldest, Michael, decided that he could provide more if he emigrated to the United States and sent money back. So at 19 years old, he left, settling in Connecticut. Over time, he raised enough to bring over each of his siblings. Patrick came over in 1848 when he was 16. For a time, Patrick worked with Michael to support the family, but he felt a strong pull to the priesthood. So in 1851, he left Connecticut and went to seminary in Chicago. How did the family manage without his help? Well, not well. After just a few years, he left seminary to go back to work. The California gold rush was in full swing by this point, so he, one of his brothers, and four friends went in together, staked out a claim in Moore's Flat, California, and in 1854, he began to prospect for gold and dig tunnels through mountains. That's quite a transition, seminary to gold mining. How did he do? Oh, very well, actually. He had obviously grown up with hardship and doing hard work, but probably more importantly, he was huge, 6'3", 250 pounds. He was the tallest and toughest man in town, and everyone knew it. Miners in the area, and let's remember that miners weren't exactly a genteel type, would come to him to arbitrate disputes over who had a claim to which land for mining purposes. He was known to be very fair-minded, and no one wanted to tussle with him, so when he gave his ruling, everyone accepted it. His arbitration prevented many fights, and probably worse. Over time, he and his associates actually also made lots of money. So he was well-suited to the life of a miner and quite successful. Did he give any thought to making mining his life? I mean, with his talents, he could have continued making a lot of money for a long time. No, he actually would spend most of his spare time keeping up on his seminary studies. He had brought his textbooks with him, and the allure of money never diminished his desire to become a priest. I must have been noticed. I bet there weren't a lot of miners who were spending a lot of time <laughs> reading books. No, I'd say that wasn't very common, but it was that studious aspect that won him such respect. Also, the circuit priests who would come to Moore's Flat to offer the sacraments came to know about his seminary and past, and they told Bishop Eugene O'Connell of the local diocese, Grass Valley, about this massive seminary and minor. Bishop O'Connell took an interest in him and eventually encouraged him to return to seminary. Eventually, he did. So he returned to Illinois? Uh, not this time. Now he went big. He went to one of the best seminaries in the world, Saint-Sulpice, in Paris. Now keep in mind, at the time, seminarians had to pay their own way through seminary or enter vows with a religious community. But Minogue had, by this time, made so much money that he was able to help support his family, travel to Paris, and pay his own way through Saint-Sulpice, and he still had lots left in the bank. He was eventually ordained in Paris in 1861, and he returned to be a priest for the Diocese of Grass Valley. His first assignment was the northern half of Nevada. He chose Virginia City as the base for his new parish, and this put him back in touch with his old mining buddies. Yeah, I imagine having connections in the mining fields proved really helpful. Oh, yeah both because he knew what they needed spiritually and how to talk to them, but also because things had changed with his buddies. In the intervening years, a number of those guys whom he'd labored and sweat with in the mines had amassed massive fortunes of their own. So when it came time for him to build a new church there in Virginia City, it only took him two years to raise the $12,000 he needed. Now, mind you, $12,000 in 1863 is equal to $240,000 today. So, and this fundraising prowess through connections to gold, silver, and mining wealth and his own personal wealth would come in handy multiple times over the next 20 years. And his incredible work ethic also paid off pretty well in such a huge parish. He traveled all over, ministering to the poor, the wealthy, the many Native American tribes who still inhabited the land, immigrants, it didn't matter. Care of his flock was paramount. Yeah, there's a great story from Minogue's time as a priest there that really shows the life of a priest in the Old West. Oh, yeah. So, it was a great story of a shepherd fighting for his sheep. He was called to the bedside of a 
dying woman in the middle of the night. When he arrived, the woman's anti-Catholic husband met him at the door brandishing a pistol, bellowing that no blankety-blank priest was going to get near his wife. Father Minogue, the old miner, had been around pistols and angry men before and knew exactly what to do. He decked the man, took his pistol, and left him dazed on the path outside the house. He went in, administered the last rites, then he left the cabin, returned the pistol to the man, and went back to his rectory. So now I'm imagining John Wayne in a castle. <laughs> yeah, you could really see Wayne playing Minogue in a movie. And there's another episode that could be made a, a movie unto itself. He was alerted that there was a man on death row who wished to see a priest. So he rode on horseback 180 miles in the winter to be with the condemned man. During that meeting, he became convinced of the man's innocence. So he rode another 180 miles on horseback, some part of it in a blizzard, to convince the governor to pardon the man. He succeeded in winning that pardon. Wow, that really shows a lot of dedication to the people of his parish. So let's now talk about Minogue's time as a bishop. When was he named a bishop? Well, in 1880, he was asked to become coadjutor bishop of Grass Valley. He accepted, but only on the condition that the city of Sacramento, just 57 miles away from the city of Grass Valley, be included in the diocese and be made the sea city. Why was he so intent on making Sacramento the sea city? Well, beginning in 1854, the California state government had begun meeting in Sacramento. In 1879, the state government officially named Sacramento as the permanent state capital. At the time, the city was in the Archdiocese of San Francisco, but it was actually much closer to the city of Grass Valley. He reasoned that it was proper for a capital city also to be a diocesan sea city, and since the Archdiocese wasn't going to move from San Francisco, it made sense for his diocese, Grass Valley, to make the move. That makes sense. So he became the Bishop of Sacramento. Well, not yet. After some wrangling with San Francisco and the Vatican over the move, he was consecrated coadjutor Bishop of Grass Valley in 1881. Then, in 1884, when Bishop O'Connell resigned, Minogue became the second and final Bishop of Grass Valley. Two years later, when the transfer of the see was complete, the Diocese of Grass Valley was suppressed, the Diocese of Sacramento established, and Patrick Minogue was its first bishop. So now, of course, he needed a new cathedral in his new sea city. Yes, so Minogue thought it was very important for the cathedral to be very near the capital. So in 1886, he secured a plot one block from the state capital. Some sources say the land was donated by Peter Burnett, the former governor of California, but according to an article published at the time of the cathedral's dedication, Burnett sold the land to Minogue for $40,811, which is more than $1.1 million today. Again, Minogue was able to make this happen. So he was able to acquire the land, and now he needed the church. And his time in Paris influenced the design he chose, right? Yeah, yes. He was especially fond of the magnificent Church of the Holy Trinity in Paris, so he turned back to old mining connections to raise the funds that would be needed to build such an edifice. One major donor was a guy named John William Mackey, who was a friend of his from back in the day and who had become one of the richest men in the world in the silver mines of Nevada. So between the money he raised from these guys and from his own remaining wealth, Minogue's massive cathedral was underway in short order. The cornerstone was laid in 1887 and the structure was completed just two years later. At the time of its completion in 1889, it was the largest cathedral west of the Mississippi with its main tower rising 210 feet. But the cathedral was not the only thing Bishop Minogue built for his diocese. Oh, not by a long shot. In his 11 years as bishop before his death in 1895, Patrick Minogue built many hospitals, schools, and churches throughout his diocese, largely with money raised from his old mining friends. So he really was a giant of a man in more than one way. Indeed. You've been listening to American Catholic History on the StarQuest Production Network. To learn more about today's topic, to find previous episodes, and to send feedback, please visit sqpn.com history. You can email us at history at sqpn.com or follow StarQuest on social media at facebook.com slash StarQuest Media or on Twitter at SQPN. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History on StarQuest. Quest.